Hello everyone, today I'm going to show you how you can use Foretics 1D to analyse your thin layer chromatography images. So today I'm going to be showing you how we can analyse a thin layer chromatography image, gel, slide, however you've managed to do it, uh, within our Foretics 1D software. So as you can see I've got an image here of a TLC slide and I've just imported it into Foretics. And the first thing I can notice is that when I've imported it, I've actually got troughs instead of peaks in my 3D view. Don't know if you'll be able to see this on the video, but there are some very faint troughs here. So this tells me that I need to invert the measurements that are coming out of that image to make them line up with, to see, so the software can see peaks instead of uh, background. So if I just come here and click on invert measurements, and as you can see, that's really played with the contrast of the image and now I can't see anything. So this gives me a good opportunity to show you the contrast and, and false color tools that are built into Foretics to help you visualize images better. So let's see. So click auto contrast. So there we go. Let's see if the full contrast is a bit better. No, it's a bit wa washed out. So if I go for the auto contrast and if I just drop the gamma down a little bit, you can see I'm getting much better better resolution of kind of my spots. There we go, that's a lot better. Okay, I'm gonna stick with that, but I might have a look at the different color schemes that I have here just to see if I can change the contrast between the, the sample and the background to see if I can get a better visualization, which I'll use later for my kind of quantification. So. I just the Kamasi blue is quite nice there. Um, so I think I'm going to use because these are quite faint in terms of signal versus background. I think I'm going to use one of the heat map options. So the heat map options really come into their own when you're trying to visualize faint spots or faint bands in your experiment because they really amp up the contrast between the two. So I think I'm going to go for heat map number one here. Um, which has the benefit of making you feel like you're the predator because it looks like the predator vision from everyone's favorite Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. Okay, here we go, right. So I'm going to analyze this image as it is here. Changing the contrast and changing these kind of the colors that I apply to the image don't change the underlying image itself. So you don't need to worry about the actual image being overwritten. It's just the way the computer is perceiving. So therefore I am perceiving the data held within that image to make it easier for me as a human being and with human eyes to analyze this image. So I'm not going to use the automatic lane detection feature on this image because it's quite noisy and I don't think it'll handle very well the fact that this is a TLC image so instead of distinct individual bands we've kind of got these smeared fractions of sample. So I'm going to come through and I'm going to do it manually and what I'm going to do is I'm going to add three lanes and I'll go into further detail as to why I'm going to add three in a second. So I'll have my two that cover my sample that are that are obvious here and I'll have a third one that I reserve for my RF measurement. So if I just come through and edit these, just make this one a very thin one. And I will just bring that across. So what I want to do, it, it's hard to see now that I've turned on the heat map, but there are two pencil marks on the edge of this slide. One of them is the, um, the where my samples were administered to the slide. And the other is the solvent front, so where my solvent in my experiment has run to. And it's these points that we use to calculate the RF, uh, which is the retardation factor. Um, for the kind of fractions to see how far they've moved in relation to each other. And then if I come across and I line this lane up with that. As you can see, within Foretics, we've got the ability to produce these great bendy lanes because we are fully aware that not every experiment runs completely straight, but we've got these great tools to kind of accommodate for that. So again, this lane hasn't run completely straight vertically along this slide, but it doesn't matter. We can just bend our lanes to accommodate that to make sure that we're capturing all of the signal within that lane. And what we want to do is we want to get the top and the bottom of our lane lined up with these pencil marks and with the top and the bottom 
of our third lane of our first lane sorry which we're going to use to calculate our f so if I bring that along and I'm just going to make this lane a bit thinner because I don't want to capture this area of high background here but I do want to capture all of the signal there we go so I'm quite happy with that now so let's move on to the background removal step now background removal if I just click on lane 2 so here you can see there's the profile of our lane so these peaks are essentially our spots and because this is a TLC image it does have quite high background in that there are basically this is all continuous sample in different fractions but there's not there is here but there's not really space for background in it between the samples so I'm going to use the rolling ball subtraction method that we've got built into Fretics because this is an algorithm that deals really well with changing background across the length of a lane now what it does is it recalculates the as you move along the lane it changes the background relative to the background at that point in the lane whereas if we just use something like a constant value say 20 it doesn't take into account areas of the lane so for example here this is background there's no signal here however this section of background for our experiment is, is lower than this area of background here so if i used a constant value to remove this i would still be counting this towards my towards my measurements so that's why we, we would always recommend using rolling ball. However, in some experiments, there's very little difference between rolling ball and some of the other methods. It's just that in most experiments, rolling ball is generally the best one to use. So if I just have a look through my lanes, I'm happy with that. Again, a TLC experiment is less about kind of quantifying bands and defining bands and more about working out how far fractions have moved in relation to each other and things like that however we do have the tools to do kind of quantification and volume measurement within Foretics. coming through to the molecular weight section of Foretics 1d workflow this is where we're going to define the start and end points of our sample and our solvent this is the two points that we're going to use to calculate our retardation factor and i'm going to apply those markers to my lane one because obviously I've got my pencil markers from when I've actually run my experiment to say where I put my sample and where my solvent front ended up at the end of the experiment. Now to do this, I've created a template with the units of RF and I'm going to be using this one that's got three steps in it rather than two. The difference being that when I've got three steps in my um, molecular, well, in my ladder that I'm going to use to cal calibrate the RF value, it allows me to fit that to a calibration curve and it can get much more accurate measurement of where my various fractions have ended up in relation to the kind of length of the lane, how far they've moved. So I've got, called it TLC Demo 2, I've named it, uh, I've put the units as RF. Uh, I've got my, I've got three steps, so I've got 100%, 50% and 0%. So this is just a measure of, this is the same as RF being 1, 0 0.5 or 0. I've just represented it as percentage because it's easier to work with. So if I come through, if I close that, so now if I left click on my, just make sure I've got my first lane selected here in my view. So if I just left click on the top of my lane, you can see that it's, it's because there are no bands on this lane, it's kind of just dumped the, the lane markers wherever it wants. So what I'm going to do is just left click and drag these along to various points in the lane. Now, I know that my lanes are lined up and you can see here, it's because there's a slice of the lane underneath the profile, I can see that this is my pencil mark here. So if I put this, if I put my zero point right in the center of my pencil mark here from where my samples were added, pop that back to full size. And then if I zoom in again on this pencil mark, which again is here and is represented by this peak, I can see that my, my 100 needs to be right at the peak here on my pencil mark and as you can see you can be really really accurate with your RF values here by 
assigning them. If I had used a, a slightly finer point pencil, I would have been able to get even more accuracy. But if I just pop those there, right on the center of the top of the peak there. And then my 50 value, I'm going to put in the middle of my lane, so 50%. So I can see here that there is a measurement of my lane length. So the lane here, this lane that I've designated to cover these two pencil marks is 315.38 millimeters. So half of that would be 175, ooh, 182, 182.5-ish. So if I, so I can move this along here. Unfortunately, it doesn't give me a live um, millimeter perfect readout, but I can just hover my mouse over the point here and it shows me it shows me at the bottom here in this section of the screen exactly where that point is so 181 I'm going to put that about there again it doesn't need to be hugely accurate um, because these are quite large fractions they, they cover a range and what's more important is knowing their distance traveled relative to each other rather than specifically knowing the exact distance when they traveled so I'm going to be fine with that so as you can see when I've got my three points I can calibrate my I can create my calibration curve so I can fit my values to the curve of my known quantities which in this case I've used RF values instead of molecular weight but this is the curve that my results are going to be read off of so and this is this is I'm going to put this as linear because I know that this is kind of a, a linear run as these fractions move across the slide or the plate. So now if I come to my band section, I'm not going to attempt to use the automatic band detection feature for this because I just know that it's not going to do a very good job of picking out these very diffuse spots. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go, I've got my lane two and three here and I'm just going to left click within the profile view and identify my fractions. So I'm just left clicking and dragging to cover the area that I believe is a fraction. And as you can see, as I do this, as I release the mouse, we start to see uh, these, these areas being built up here. So it starts giving me the RF value. So it's 52, so that'll be 0.52 if you were using you know, um, sub one numbers. If you're doing it kind of the, the classical way where you do everything as a division of one. So I've got all of my sections here. So what I can do is so I've got lane two band seven. That's moved slightly further down the plate than it has here but again it's it's very close so this is how you would get your RF values out from your experiment and you can also get the volume um, so this is the volume of the peak so the volume of the peak will be relative to the amount of substance within the fraction that it is that you're separating using your chromatography technique now the normalize and the quantity calibration functions are not going to be much help here well I mean you could, with the normalized functions, if you had a known fraction and you wanted to see how that fraction changed between the two different samples, or if you've got more than two, you could, what you could do is you could left click on one and use that and use that, set that as 100%. And then if I just come down to the bottom and then turn on my normalized volume, I can see that this, this fraction represents 100%, so I could compare it to all the other fractions within my uh, experiment, so I could see if my fraction has been enriched under certain conditions or it's been depleted under certain conditions. And I can see in lane three, band two, there's actually the actual intensity of that fraction in the second sample that I've run, so lane three, it's 42% higher than it is normalized to this fraction within this sample. And then quantity calibration, you would use exactly the same as we do in our Gellum Western block techniques. So if I had a standard lane 
um, with known quantities in each fraction, I could give them, I could define them as being, you know, this is this is one nanogram, and then this fraction there's 0.5 nanograms. And then in this fraction, there's two nanograms of, of whatever it may be. And again, I'll get a, a calibration curve that I can use to read off the values for all of the other fractions within my experiment if I have included these known quantities, these known standards within my experiment. And if I just put on, so if I just turn on the quant quantity calibrated volume, again, I can see everything relative to the samples that I've selected. So I can see the, the abundance of the fractions relative to all of the standards that I had within my experiment. Now, if I come through to my results section, again, I have all of the options that I have when I'm doing a, a kind of a Western blot analysis, an immunoblot analysis, a gel analysis. I can export these band informations. Now, remember, you don't want to be considering lane one because that's just used as your RF marker. But you can do lane two and lane three. You can export those and you can choose what columns you want to display for each one. Your band percentage, lane percentage. So how much of the percentage does each fraction take up? How much of the lane does each fraction take up, etc. And you can export this file as a CSV or you can straight copy this, this table to your clipboard. So you can paste it into SPSS, Minitab, R, any kind of um, other statistical programming, uh, other kind of statistical software that you might use for your um, data analysis further down the line. You can also generate PDF reports, including images of your TRC slide and generate a proper Excel CSV file with extended data beyond what is shown in the table. So good thing to remember is everything that you've turned on here in the table, that is what will be exported. That is what will be copy and pasted. So uh, you want to make sure that you've got everything that you want to display within this table. Thanks for listening. And if you'd like to try and analyze your own TLC images using Fretix 1D, please check out the links in the description below for a free trial copy.